I'd like to welcome you all to this event being hosted by the UCL Institute for Human Rights. We are honored to have with us a number of guests who will be introduced in a moment, but not by me, um, to discuss a question that was described by the um, Human Rights Commission, which is now the Human Rights Council at the UN, in 1993 as an ongoing question of gross human rights violations. And that description, that epithet, has not changed. That was 1993, we're now in 2011, and it is still a situation of gross human rights <coughs> violations. Um, the event format to discuss this question, which as you know from the title, the question of forced evictions, will be that um, unlike in standard events, that you have uh, to discuss these kind of questions where you have a, the high and mighty giving a presentation from the panel um, and everyone gets a little bit bored. What we're going to do is we're going to have just one simple presentation at the beginning to frame the discussion. And then Gautam Bam, who I will explain who he is in a moment, will act as a moderator and facilitator um, and we will have hopefully a very interactive discussion between the panel and yourselves as the audience. So this is not us telling you things. Of course, we're going to try and tell you the things that we know, but it's us in conversation with you about this very serious matter. The reason the event was called was to launch the report that you have before you. It's on this table, and it will be available later in the reception upstairs uh, on forced evictions, which is an amazing document detailing the experiences, lives, the point of view of the people facing these evictions in various different contexts. Um, the report's available here if you want to get a copy today. It's available at cost price. It's only £10. Uh, that's how much it costs to publish it. And I, I hope that one of you, you know, some of you will take, take this away with you today. If we run out, there's a list there for you to put your name and we can provide it in the future. It will be reprinted using the money that you provide. So any money that goes into it today will not be used for any other purpose than to just continue to reproduce this report. Um, after the event, there will be a reception upstairs. There's some wine and things to nibble at, but mainly it will be a reception for you to give you an opportunity in a less formal setting to continue the conversation uh, with, with all of us um, at that stage. Before sitting down, I should introduce our moderator properly. This is Gautam Ban, who's sitting at the end. Gautam is a writer, an activist, a campaigner, and also an academic who has been working assiduously on the politics of poverty in urban India. In particular, his relevance to today's discussion is that he's a member of the anti-evictions movement in Delhi and also co-authored a book in 2006 entitled Swept Off the Map, Surviving Eviction and Resettlement in India. Sorry, in Delhi. The book highlighted exactly the things, you can see it there, that we're going to discuss today at a time when no one else was highlighting those things in the same way. It was reprinted in Hindi in 2009, uh, and it consists of one of the largest non-governmental studies of the impact of eviction on the urban poor. He is currently a doctoral candidate at the University of California, Berkeley, but we won't hold that against him. And um, he's with the Indian Institute for Human Settlement. Um, let me welcome him to moderate the event and to formally open this event and discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Saladin. And uh, my thanks to all the panel and to Eve Kaban in particular uh, for giving me the opportunity to be here. Um, Eve has placed me on a red chair on the extreme left. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I am... Uh, happily comfortable in being here, and I will try not to move towards the right, as the rest of the world seems to be doing through the course of the evening. Um, but I, I think it is very exciting to be on a panel like this, uh, and I think that one of the reasons that um, Saladin was mentioning we decided not to do a series of panels to give you a set of presentations and answers is because we don't have any. Um, for many of us as activists and those struggling in, against evictions for many years, what we have our stories of struggle. Um, we have some victories, but as Eve and I were talking about this morning, there are preciously few. Um, and I think it's critical for us to ask together today, 
why that is so, um, both to understand this phenomenon that we are faced with, um, and I think to recognize what a lot of us don't immediately recognize is that even those of us not at the end of a bulldozer's eviction are still involved in the story of evictions in our cities. And the question of our relationship to them is, I think, a question we have to ask ourselves. And I hope that we will do that today um, and not just think about evictions uh, as stories of things that happen to people elsewhere, um, as stories that happen outside Europe, um, as stories that happen only in the developing world, as stories that happen not to people who we know or to people who would be in this room, but as stories to which we are intimately connected and perhaps in ways that should or does already make us uncomfortable um, because we are very much citizens of the same cities in which the stories you will hear are occurring. And what do we do with that knowledge? And how do we become agents? It's not just activists who must think about evictions, it's also everyday citizens of our cities all around the world who must think about what it means um, for our fellow citizens to be evicted. So I'm very happy for us to be here. Um, we'll try and keep it fast and pacey, and so I will hand it over to Eve and to Sylvia, uh, who are two of the co-editors of this report. Um, Eve is the, dir the Director of Development Planning, uh, the Chair of Development Planning at the DPU, at the Development Planning Unit at the University College London. Um, he has also, um, for the past seven years, been the con convener of the Advisory Group on Forced Evictions in the United Nations. Um, he is also part of the International Alliance of Inhabitants, um, of other representatives we have, and he's one of the co-editors of this report. Um, Sylvia Yafai is a Brazilian-American architect and urbanist. She works on issues of housing and land rights, on innovation in housing policy and practice. She's the head of the international programs at the Building and Social Housing Foundation and also one of the co-editors of this report. And they are going to lead you in the framing presentation that we have. Good afternoon. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, jointly with uh, and hosted by the recently created, uh, I would say, Institute for the Human Rights at the, at the UCL. And uh, it's quite important because we try to explore today what are the links that exist between land and housing evictions and social and economic rights. Because as in terms of rights, we are pretty much into silos, you know, those working on land, on housing, on health, on economic, social, cultural rights, we've decided together to explore that with you. What are the implications when you evict a family uh, on, on land and housing? So our report was very much focused on housing and land eviction. So that's what we would like jointly with Sylvia and Cassidy, who is, it, who is uh, here with us and with the other co-editor of uh, this report to introduce very briefly what is the report about, to give you what we call the tip of the iceberg. I mean, three very short films of two minutes just to get a sense of what we are speaking about in very different kind of uh, situations. All right? So I'll start here. And... Uh, first... We were needed a, a definition, and, and we hope that Saladin later on will um, analy analyze critically what is called forced evictions, what we've been looking into in, in this number of cities jointly with uh, uh, people and movement. So forced eviction, the permanent or temporary removal against their will of individuals, families, and or communities from their homes and all the land which they occupy without the provision of and access to appropriate forms of legal and other protection and with or without state sanction. So this is like the jargon which is being used to define forced evictions and we need to unpack, to analyze that critically tonight. And it's part of the general comment and the right to adequate housing. So this is what we're referring to. So with this in mind, forced evictions, it's not, it's a global issue. It became a global issue. If you look at the recent report that happily Malavika Vartak, who is here, has been largely contributing to put together here, um, in, her, in the last report of Corre in 2009, before she left, the, the just left at that time the, the institution, I mean, they identified 
835 cases representing over 4 million people for, for two years. So people being forcibly evicted or, or threatened are not a bunch of families here and another couple of hundreds there or 20 or 30. It's becoming a massive issue worldwide. It's more and more brutal, every day more brutal. They are larger in size, but also maintaining the one-to-one -one kind of eviction process. They appear in large number of settlements from megacities in permitted cities, villages, mining cities, a large number of settlements. What is remarkable is that out of these around 1,000 cases documented, cases which have been documented of averted cases, successful cases, are only five of them. So we have here something of a gap of knowledge. It doesn't mean that there hasn't been lots of cases, but the documentation is extremely limited according to this report. I think it's slightly more than that. What we were saying as part of the advisory group on forced evictions, trying to play with numbers, is that at the current pace, 60 to 70 million people will have been evicted between 2000 and 2020. And this seems even conservative as a number. And we compare with the 100 million uh, slum improvement objective of people on the NDGs of the Millennium Development Goals, it shows that, I mean, maybe 100 million would be improved, but 70 will lose their homes. So it's, it's a massive issue today in terms of development. Despite dramatic increases in forced evictions, many people-led initiatives have succeeded in reducing the number of evictions, developing new policies, proving that alternatives to forced evictions can be found. So there's a gold mine of initiatives which are usually people-led, some of them documented, very few of them properly documented. So what <coughs> we're trying to do is to work on documenting practical experiences and share people-based initiatives. At the starting point, we said there are a large number of alternatives of actions that people are taking. So we try to list them down and see how people face eviction before we try to, to identify and go deeper into understanding better. So what we identified at the beginning was that the key strategies that we could identify was negotiation with public authorities, sometimes re getting a relocation package, but accepting to be displaced. Some, some of the strategies are there to get the best package, uh, usually individually. Legal channels and court cases, a lot of movements are going to court. Another one which is very much Brazilian, but largely shared by others was to occupy land, squat land or squat housing, to resist in order either to be displaced and get another one, but it, it starts with occupation of, of land, occupy, resist and live. In some cases, political and revolutionary movement like in Istanbul, we see that are making of the open resistance street struggle part of their revolutionary struggle. So housing and resisting housing is part of a much wider perspective they have in mind, but at the same time, they resist. <coughs> Some, much less, are at the same time very pragmatic on resistance and building rights and policies of people's initiative, like we see in Santo Domingo, for instance, where uh, at the same time, very much rooted locally, that's able to design from a people's based perspective some initiatives for uh, laws to be discussed in Parliament. And a large number of actions are related to campaigning campaign, either locally or internationally. So that was our kind of preliminary mapping that we wanted to explore. <coughs> now I'll pass to um, Sylvia to, to continue uh, presenting uh, more about the, 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 the stu stages of the project. Thank you. So this work was carried out in two different stages. First, looking at documenting these experiences, gathering the narratives of local groups that had faced eviction or were currently facing eviction, 
Um, this was part of a social production of knowledge. It was really a process that's quite important to mention um, beyond just the document that you'll see here. Um, groups were brought together to contribute to um, writing down these narratives. A set of guidelines was developed together with these groups on how you can document these different experiences. And um, there's, the guidelines are available at the back of the report as well. Um, but quite a, a large volume of information was generated through that and edited down to the report. Um, but really important to mention the various the collaborators and people and residents who were involved in that. And then developing a cross-sectional analysis, looking at where the linkages are with these various different places. Um, the second part was an exchange, sharing these experiences. So in February last year in Istanbul, we had um, an international exchange seminar where we had representatives from each of the groups that were involved um, coming together to share their own experiences and also work with some of the groups in Istanbul <coughs> who, have been, who are currently facing eviction, a um, lot of violence and very serious conditions. So working with the groups that already had dealt with this in, in different ways. Um, Here we have the um, cases that were included um, in the report. So, Buenos Aires, Portalavia, Santo Domingo from Latin America, Durban in South Africa. Um, two cases in Egypt that were rural cases, um, differently from the others that were all urban. Um, Karachi, uh, Hangzhou in China, and Istanbul who hosted the event. And it was the housing rights coordination that hosted the event. A lot of volunteers came together. Special thank you to the International Alliance of Inhabitants who also contributed to writing the report and the, the exchange. Our friends from China unfortunately couldn't join us for the um, event, but here we can see a few pictures from the exchange. Um, there were a lot of different languages represented. We had um, volunteers doing simultaneous translation in Turkish and Spanish and English, consecutive to Urdu and Arabic and Portuguese, so that was a challenge, but it was incredible. I think once that was <coughs> brought together, how um, people came and shared their experiences. And the outcome of this event fed into the report as well, um, and the final version that you'll see. And I'll hand back to you. These eight cases that you saw were corresponding normally to one of the strategies. So that we made a kind of a matrix of what could be the cases to work upon to explore one of the pre-identified strategies with different sort of networks. So th the intention was to connect strategies, networks, but based on cases. Some belonging to the, uh, or very strongly linked to the Asian coalition of housing rights, like in <coughs> Pakistan. And other cases being more linked with the Novox network and others linked to the International Alliance of Inhabitants. The idea being, the idea being trying to be to connect experiences from large networks, but always rooted in action and, and reflection. And this was largely successful, I would say. And, and, and we learned a lot from that. But the questions are relatively basic, but they were corresponding to what Sylvia was saying questions that are relevant for people. We started with some questions and then it was adapted in various languages, etc. And so basically what we found in the report is where within the city or the region are they taking place? Is it more in downtown old centers or at the periphery or both? We wanted to understand a little bit the spatial logic of it. What kind of settlement? Why are they taking place? Is there a common thread between them? how people face evictions. What have been the tactics and the strategy? Do they share commonalities beyond belonging to very different networks coming from different perspectives? And to make a kind of a balance, to, to, to get a fresh look at what are the victories and the defeats, to get a, a proper look at that. Yeah. So these were the various movements involved, belonging to totally different approaches some more confrontational, others better in negotiations, others very good at policy making. So it was a kind of the maximum mix we could get. And they were all invited and most of them uh, responded positively. So it's, it's, this is pretty unique about, I would say, this, uh, this report because it's, it gathers people who usually have not been working for some reason or, or good reason or not uh, together. 
Now, we would like to share with you three times two, uh, three, two minutes. Yeah? Three films. Let's see if it works now. The first one is uh, <coughs> images from uh, Operation Muramatsvina. Clear, which is translated by clear out the trash, 700,000 people evicted and 1.5 million people affected. And these are accepted conservative uh, numbers. We have the, the, the chance here to have uh, Mike Davis, who is please, Mike, uh, who has been at the forefront of the struggle along with his uh, co colleagues and comrades from uh, the um, what uh, CRA, which stands for Arare Residents, combined Arare Residents, something that, um, yes, the association, all right? After another sun is out. and presidential elections in Zimbabwe from the year 2000 resulted in resounding victories in urban areas for the newly formed opposition party, the movement for democratic change. This phenomenon did not, however, bring about a change of government and Robert Mugabe's Zanu Pires remained in power. In May 2005, six weeks after another result, the ZANU PF government launched a countrywide campaign known as Operation Murambachina, ostensibly to clean up urban areas. Settlements, some informal, but others rigid official local council approval, were raised to the ground. Thousands of families were brutally chased away from their homes and either dumped in rural areas or headed into camps. Some died. Small industry and informal sector traders saw their businesses demolished and their livelihoods wiped out. Behold, oh, in shock, the ill films of a diabolic craftsman which dresses shameful weaknesses with Operation Muramachina. Operation Crisis! Operation Crime, Operation Condemned the Poverty, Eternal Poverty, Operation Condemned the Poverty, Eternal Hell, Operation Condemnation of Sanity, Operation Mend the Poor, Operation Mend the Poor, Operation Rob from the Same Poor, Operation Create Orphans. <coughs> All right, so this is a, a very short extract from a much longer film five years later five years after the, um, the dramatic uh, evictions which took place. The second, uh, I would like to take you to Istanbul, Turkey, to have uh, two moments of a frontal resistance, just to uh, get a, a feeling of how it's like, and then more at the neighborhood level, which will take, again, two minutes. This is a part of, a, of, of the frontal defense of the whole neighborhood, what we saw that 
three, four story buildings were going to be demolished. And they are usually. And uh, the second part is another neighborhood in Bay Coast. Again, in the, um, in, uh, the periphery of, um, of Istanbul. And then the bulldozers come. It's about 1.5 million people who are threatened to have their neighborhood usually consolidated, of two, three story buildings, which are gradually being demolished. Uh, evictions are not only happening in the global south, even if our work, the report was concentrated in uh, cities more from Global South plus Istanbul, which is like not exactly the same. But uh, because we were in the UK, we wanted to share with you, you know, that uh, th they, ha they happen also in the, in, in the Europe, in, in the United States. And we took as a, as a case probably one of the most dramatic one, which is the eviction of uh, Romani people. And I'm glad that we have the Romani community here from uh, Romania and uh, that uh, we have the Gypsy Council represented, I mean, forces that all over Europe are uh, threatened, 12 to 14 million people are threatened, just because they are of uh, um, a different race. So here is it in, in the UK, the temple of democracy. There's plenty of local authorities who are wasting far too much money on evictions. Evictions are happening every single day. We get plenty of phone calls at the Gypsy Council from families, from traveller families, who say, we're being moved on again. We're moved on yesterday. We're moved on the day before. Can you tell me how to stop it? We don't, we don't have the answer how to stop every local authority moving those families on. What we need to do is tackle the local authorities and ask them why are they wasting their council taxpayers' money on moving the same families round and round and round when all they need to do is identify a site and let the family stay there. If the situation is not resolved and travellers do not have places where they can either live permanently without being um, moved on, or where they can go temporarily and then move on when they want, then the problem is just going to continue with the legal encampments and all the problems that that, that entails. 
we do need somewhere to live that's legal and safe. That's all we're asking. We're not asking for a billion pound, you know, a billion pound site that, uh, that's going to cost the government an arm and a leg. That's all we're asking is for more sites. It's for somewhere to live, just like anybody, every human being in the world that's got a right for somewhere to live. And that's all we ask. I'm living on my mum, so when I got married, we need some more sites so I can have a plot of my own just to be clean, tidy. That's what we need. We have an unresolved, very large issue as far as I'm concerned. We've got one in four uh, of the gypsy community are still living on unauthorised or whatever you want to term it, illegal sites. And that statistic is far too high. This is really a very crucial time because I think we all know the outcry that you... Alright, so the three films are the tip of an iceberg. We had long lists to choose from. We just wanted to share with you the complexity of what we call forced evictions and to try to find a thread between Gura Batsuina between the <coughs> gypsies and travellers here, like Candy Sheridan, who is an average traveller, who was telling us, or in Istanbul, what, what, what do these situations share in common? And this is hopefully some of the answers given by the own actors, which, are, uh, which is in the report. Thank you. Thank you, Eve, and Sylvia, and Cassidy, both for the report and for that presentation. Let me actually begin and maybe go back to Saladin, um, who uh, I should introduce as um, the co-director of the UCL Institute for Human Rights, a uh, lecturer in human rights and political theory who has published extensively on human rights and social justice. Saladin, you know, he puts up the general comment definition to forced eviction. Um, you know, I, that we have a, a legal technical starting point in a sense. The question that I think that we should open with actually is to say, is it enough? What is it actually telling us about what an eviction is? What the experience of an eviction is? And is it a st what do we do, as Eve said, with the jargon? And how does it translate into the videos and the experiences that we just saw? Thank you. Um, I want to try and avoid as much technicality as possible, but I may have to engage in a little bit of technicality in a moment. One thing that is not up there, which is this, the next sentence, of that general comment. If, if all of, for, for those of you who, who don't know the technicalities of international law, countries have signed a treaty. Um, effectively, all countries in the United Nations have had to sign um, treaties on human rights. And one of the treaties that they've signed is called the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. And in that covenant, there's a list of entitlements that these countries undertake in front of the rest of the world, in front of all other states, to give to their citizens or anyone who is under their power. And that list includes a, uh, a right to adequate standard of living. And in that right, there's a, a list of things that the adequate standard of living must include. And one of those things is, of course, an adequate home, right? an adequate access to housing. But of course, those things are written in very abstract terms, and it can be, that can mean anything. And so there are special organizations that are set up together with the treaties when the, the states of the world got together to put these things um, into play. And these organizations are called the treaty bodies, and their role is to interpret those words so that we can all have a better idea of what they mean. Mm -hmm. right? And the governments themselves can be clearer about what they owe to their citizens. And those are the general comments. And there is a special general comment with regard to this right to a home as part of the right to an adequate standard of living. And in that general comment, it's called the general comment on forced eviction. So it's specifically about this issue. And it gives that definition. However, the problem is that it's not the only thing it says. The next sentence after this definition. So here you could say, well, look, it's, it's, it's ruling out evicting people in, you know, in a way that's against their will and that doesn't you know, give them access to sufficient remedy for it or to some kind of response, doesn't help them with law. In the next sentence it says, this does not apply, this does not include um, any eviction, forcible or otherwise, that is carried out in accordance with either in accordance with law, so test number one, or 
in accordance with the provisions of the international covenants, with the rest of the international covenants on human rights. So there's a really weird thing there. Mm. The weird thing is it's, it tells you, this is, this is going to tell you how to understand the covenant on right. what you're owed as a matter of your right to housing. And then it says, well, uh, it means <coughs> eviction so long as they don't go against the covenant. So it's a kind of circular mm -hmm. definition which leaves a number of problems. Another um, uh, general comment, which is general comment four, on the same issue that was produced by this body to help understand is much more helpful. It helps us to, if you like, contextualize the issue. And that says that housing, which is owed to everyone as a matter of right by any, by any state that signs this treaty, right, housing must fulfill a number of criteria. Right? There, must, there must be a number of conditions it fulfills. And this will speak directly to the issues that we're going to deal with. And the criterions are availability, affordability, so there's issues of resource there, habitability, that's that there are, it's contextualized in a place where it's possible to live in this place, even if it's, you know, you could have somewhere that's very affordable, but it's on a, it's on a radioactive dump, as in many European countries, um, chemical dumps and radioactive dumps are used to house Roma communities throughout Europe, for example. Um, accessibility, in terms of being connected to the, to the world in an adequate way, and most importantly, for, for some of our discussions, cultural adequacy mm. is one that's greatly ignored. Right? That you can put someone in a home, but if you distance them just from their community, from the people with whom they must work with and engage with to live a life that's worth living, right, then you've undermined um, something very important in their life. So we're told these things by the companies. Now, that's all fine. Mm. It tells you th what states must do. But of course, these covenants, this co covenant in particular, is not enforceable right? in the sense of there isn't a, an international police force that will come to the state's house and tell them off if they're not doing this. And the only obligations of states under this covenant are to submit reports to this special body every five years, sometimes more frequently if they're asked, and to, uh, to accept visits from monitoring bodies where necessary. In particular, there's a special rapporteur from the UN that will go to your country and if there's been a complaint, we'll have a look at these complaints. Of course, the states just ignore that. Mm. They don't let them in. They write reports that said, everything we're doing is fantastic. You know, um, all our activities are in line with international law. Right. And they have a big set of lawyers that tells the world how they, how they do that. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, it's not enforceable. And on the other hand, these fine, uh, fine points that I've made about context, about culture, about integration, those are not really adequately taken into account when applying these standards. So there are two strong mm -hmm. and important weaknesses there. And I think it's, it's important to bear in mind that what these things do, and here's the positive thing they do, is they set standards. They say, here's a standard and your state must live up to it. And anyone who spots that a state isn't living up to it can take measures, can take action, to expose their state, complain about them, campaign about them, and point to these standards as something that's a legitimate basis on which to campaign. And I think that's the positive role that they have, even if they don't have this kind of policing role that we would prefer or like them, like them to have. That's the international context. Mm -hmm. George, do you want to come in on this? Sure. Why don't you let me introduce you really quickly. Um, also a co-director of the UCL Institute for Human Rights, uh, George Letzis, who's a lecturer in human rights in the European Convention here at the United University College London and has published extensively on the European Court of Human Rights and on human rights in particular. Chantal. Just to, to follow up on um, Saladin's description and add to it, uh, formally speaking, uh, these comments that Saladin read out, states treat them as non-binding. So they take the view that these UN bodies like the, U the Commission uh, the Committee on Economic Social Rights, they don't have legal powers to interpret authoritatively these covenants. So technically, that there's like kind of soft law. You know, there's yeah. some UN body expresses some standards, but they're not bound by those standards, right? They're bound by the treaty. The treaty itself uh, is worded in a uh, peculiar way. So the obligations of the states under these covenants are taken to be one of progressive realization. So we have these general embedded under enforcements of socioeconomic rights. And states, of course, take it the extreme way, read this under enforcement in the extreme way by taking those comments and taking the obligations in the covenant to be really 
not a f- so amount too much. Explain a little bit what you mean by progressive realization. Right. So uh, in in the Article Two of the Covenant on <coughs> Economic so- Social Rights, the obligations of states to protect social economic rights, like housing, are different to the obligations they have to protect civil rights. Mm-hmm. So whereas the obligations they have undertaken to protect right to life, right to be tortured, free speech, <coughs> are immediate, the obligations to protect the social economic rights are to be taken at step at the time, mm-hmm. and they have to be realized progressively as opposed to immediately. And states keep invoking this provision to justify delays and falling short of protecting those standards right. fully. And they found this textual basis on Article 2, and it says there, the Covenant says that these obligations are of progressive nature, not immediate. So, uh, I mean, this, this, is, this uh, reinforces what Salvin said, the problem of under-enforcement of international economic rights, and that is part of the picture. Right. I think that both these comments actually will raises an issue that we will come back to repeatedly, is what kind of promise does the law on the one hand, and the language of rights on the other hand actually offer us? Are they the spaces where the battle actually has to be won and fought at all? Or do we actually see from many of these cases that perhaps the limitations of not just the international covenants, but also domestic laws and constitutions, that the law and the rights language may not actually be the sites for struggle in the next contemporary period. But let me get back again uh, and bring in Malavika Vartak here, who um, is a researcher and campaigner on housing rights, um, has been part of this project and of the core report, the campaign on housing rights and evictions, uh, where she, she was part of the institution based in Ghana for a number of years, is now uh, in London with Amnesty International UK with the Poverty and Human Rights Campaign. To talk, go back to this question again of you know, asking this adequacy of law, saying, when we think about what an eviction is, what is actually the experience we're trying to capture, even if we were trying to capture it in a legal definition? So maybe we could begin to talk actually about what is the experience of eviction like and the experience of many of you as part of documenting these so that we can think about what it is actually that we're trying to respond to. Yeah, I mean, thanks. It's, it's uh, sort of, you look at General Comment 7 and uh, how it goes on to explain what constitutes a forced eviction, lack of general consultation, uh, So, uh, just on what Saladin was saying, on lack of genuine consultation, lack of an opportunity to legally represent oneself against the eviction. And those are sort of terms, but what, what really happens and how does this really translate when the eviction takes place is actually, s- in many ways, much more real and much more hard hitting. And, and that's when sort of, I mean, working in sort of very different contexts and different uh, sort of eviction <coughs> scenes, you realize that you know, forced evictions are really not only about the built environment. Yes, the bulldozer has become sort of the symbol of a forced eviction, the bulldozer coming in, but it's not just about houses falling down. It's really about people's lives, of everything that they've built up. If you're looking at it in an urban context, we're looking at lots of families, keeping in mind that forced evictions in urban contexts largely take place against minorities or uh, the vulnerable who may have migrated, the poor. So here we have people who've come from the rural areas in many cases, who've come to the city to build a life for themselves, have put down roots, have made those connections, have, you know, have an entire social network, have their jobs um, sort of in place. And so a forced eviction is not just, it's not just about your house breaking down, it's really about delegitimizing or sort of undoing everything that you've built up over years. And we've seen that in several cases of forced evictions, you know, people have been living there for 17 years, 18 years, 20. There are children, there are sort of young adults who are born in those communities that are evicted. So uh, it's, it's sort of very, it's, it, it goes much beyond sort of, you know, lack of genuine consultation, lack of an opportunity to represent oneself legally, uh, et cetera. Also, I think, uh, the other thing to remember, or um, which a lot of you would have experienced in your work as well, is that soci- communities, when facing a forced eviction, a community is not a homogenous entity. And within communities, there are power structures, there are, um, there are some families who have access or connections who can sort of you know, work things out, quickly respond to a eviction. Within the same community, you would have groups that are completely at a loss, who have really nowhere to go. And this is not really to paint a picture of, oh, 
of you know of great amount of victim victimization of a community but the fact is that you have sort of these different levels and access to power that within a community families and individuals face i mean there's this whole gendered uh, sort of aspect to evictions or the uh, you know where sort of there's very there's not a whole lot or there's not as much as one would like a lot of work done on the gendered impacts of evictions and what this does to sort of women's mobility women's uh, sort of capacity to adapt to the change do uh, in many cases we've seen that after an eviction it's the woman in the family who decides that you know it that or it's a decide for her that she is not in a position to resume her economic work whether it was working as a as domestic help or in the factory they've been shunted out far away and what does this do to women's sort of economic power within the family what does it do to um, you know access to health what does it do to access to education for children we've seen in delhi especially uh, post an eviction a lot of uh, families one in one particular case said that you know well, once we were evicted and then relocated 40 kilometers away from the city we found it very hard to send our children to schools and because because of commuting costs because of safety issues and then in this context it's often the girl child who you sort of who's kept back and said well if we only you know have to can send one person to school we'll send the boy and so so sort of the gendered implications of this also need to be looked at i think the other thing also is i mean when forced evictions actually take place but there's there's um, you know there's there's a large number of people and many more who are threatened with evictions and constantly live with the threat of an eviction hanging right. over their head and what does that do to their sort of you know social networks their job opportunities their education etc and i mean we have dale farms uh, you know where sort of the eviction threat has been hanging for a while now and you know what does it do psychologically to the community um i think uh, in amnesty we have sort of uh, uh, looked at sort of the roma evictions in italy and you know sort of a family saying that they constantly sleep with their bags packed because they don't know when they're going to be evicted so i think all these sort of pictures and need to be taken all these stories need to be taken when we really understand what an eviction is um i just like to sort of end with the real <coughs> brutality of evictions and i'd like to use um the case of harsud which is a town in madhya pradesh in india and this was in 2005 to make way for a dam and um the eviction was announced uh, notices were issued people tried to um you know challenge them but when the eviction started there were announcements made in the town that if you demolish your house within the first 2 hours of this announcement your compensation will increase by x amount now that just the process of forcing people or sort of encouraging people to break their own houses i think is just is just unacceptable and um, we had it it was a very strange situation where people were rushing to break their houses you know, and <coughs> and just because you know if i break i might get a little more because the situation is so hopeless at that point that you just want to you know save what you can and get on with your lives and um, sadly enough in harsud after people broke their houses for days later there was no rehabilitation the, re the resettlement <coughs> sites were not uh, completed many people just had to continue to live among the rubble so i'll just end okay. here No thank you for and I think it raises a, a several sort of key questions and maybe actually I will bring in Cassidy Johnson here because I think one of the questions that Malvika has brought up um immediately is that eviction lives with its twins of relocation and rehabilitation right so in one sense it's one part of a process um which very much the defense of a lot of people or at least the immediate response to an eviction is well it's not that they're being rendered homeless right so for many people you are evicted from one side but moved to another and there is an implicit assumption here that that movement is somehow neutral in its impact that it's it's the case of you know many of us as students sort of lived in a different place every year and sort of moved with a different kind of mobility um in urban india there is a peculiar word that exists only in indian english called to shift um and it just says oh i used to live there but i shifted and she's shifting this weekend and the idea of the shift is that's just a little adjustment to the left it doesn't actually make you I right, I'm already on the left so I'm not going any further but um but I think that one of the things that you bring that a lot of the case that you worked on the report brings out is that resettlement and relocation in all the cases that are being documented has a very different meaning for the poor and has played out in very different ways and I'm wondering if you can talk to us about that about 
how eviction and relocation live in this very tense relationship on the hyphen that joins them, or su so is supposed to join them. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that the, um, the report brought out a few different aspects to do with relocation and, and compensation, because as you say, Gautam, it's, it seems to be in many situations the idea is that, well, if relocation is done in such a way that people are, are properly compensated, um, that this that everything is then fine. Um, and actually, if you look at, at uh, general comment four, um, it does uh, talk about what would be the sort of appropriate uh, ways of, of developing uh, adequate housing for that, and also what would be the appropriate guidelines um, from the basic principles and guidelines on development-based evictions and displacement talks about what would be the appropriate guidelines for compensation. And thus, if these appropriate guidelines for compensation and relocation are met, then um, under uh, the International Covenants, everything is fine. But what we found from the cases is something that is quite different than that. Um, one is that, which Malavikar already spoke about, which is that relocation areas are much too far away from the original settlement and from the city. Uh, and this was something that was brought out in almost all of the cases, basically. Um, and this certainly has very large implications, as Malavika said, on the infringement of economic and social rights, because people uh, are very much impacted in their livelihoods, they're very much impacted in their ability to access schools, uh, etc. cetera. Um, the other finding that we had from the report um, was, was related to compensation. And one is that compensation that is promised to people at the time of the eviction usually does not materialize. So even if this compensation is deemed to be adequate under international covenants, what we found in the cases is that people are not getting that compensation. Um, and the other side of that also, if we look at, for example, um, the case on Karachi, uh, the Lara Expressway, um, when compensation does reach the people and people are resettled, um, often this does not replace the value of what is lost. Um, certainly in the, in the guidelines, um, <coughs> it talks about that there should be the replacement of, um, of land plots, house structures, contents, infrastructure, mortgage or other debt penalties, interim housing, bureaucratic and legal fees, alternative housing, lost wages and incomes, um, lost educational opportunities, health and medical care, resettlement and transportation costs, especially when those pertain to livelihood. So there are a lot of costs that have to be compensated for. But this compensation, certainly in the cases that we saw, does not reach this level. Um, I'll just take one example, which is not actually in the report, but something that um, I've been working on uh, with Eve and other colleagues over the last couple of years in, in Istanbul, in Silikle. Um, and it also touches to the aspect of culturally appropriate housing. Um, this community was relocated, um, which was in the historic center, uh, a Roma community in the historic center of Istanbul. They've lived there for um, several hundred years, actually, in this one area. <coughs> and um, they, were, uh, they were forcibly evicted um, and relocated to 30 kilometers away. And what has happened is that um, most of these people have actually come back. I mean, they were relocated to housing blocks 30 kilometers away and given sort of um, some decent terms of, uh, for these housing blocks. But most of them, just because they've lived in this area for so long, couldn't stay there uh, and have migrated back into the historic center, uh, living in very difficult conditions. Um, so this sort of shows these ties to spaces and, and social and social, sort of social networks, but in a very, very serious sense of social networks going back uh, hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just make one more point that we found in the in the um, in the report. I think that is that is quite important, and this comes back to the aspect of um, of what is what is uh, removal against the will. So even the definition of forced evictions, because. Um, what we see is that people are often signing, saying, okay, I will relocate and I will take this compensation, but this is not really, um, I mean, 
it is against people's wills. In some cases, like in Istanbul, in Sulukule, we have documentation that shows that these people were actually, they had no choice but to sign these things. So this whole idea of what is against the will, I think uh, we need to look into. Mm -hmm. And I think the relocation question brings up also the counter argument to the other argument that's made very frequently around eviction is that you get people who don't have a right to tenure who then have a legal right to be where they are. And that the resettlement sites, peripheralization and marginalization is meant to be overcome by the fact that at least you're no longer illegally on that land. And I think repeatedly what, um, in some of my own work in Delhi, what we actually saw people doing is saying that the inability to make a life, and I think this goes back to Malvika's point that what you're recreating is not legal title. You're recreating a community and a social fabric that is work, culture, networks, neighbors, daycare, the ability to walk to work, the ability to be to feel also to be part of the city. And I'm going to bring Eden on this question of feeling like one is part of the city and feeling as one part of the memory of the city. But to also say then that it, it bring, brings back, I think, a raging comment in, uh, and a discussion in urban studies literature between titling and tenure and what it means to give security of tenure and separating that discussion from its automatic reduction to the handing over of private property titles. And I think that, you know, um, the, the government of Delhi is currently having a series of visits by a gentleman named Hernando de Soto, um, who has uh, apparently found the direct flight between Lima and Delhi to much to our chagrin. And the question of property titles is firmly back on the table as the solution that can overcome all of the experiences of eviction and resettlement. So I think it becomes very critical to think about the actual experience of resettlement. But let me bring even on this question of, you know, you bring in the question of the Roma community in that town in, in Istanbul, having lived there for hundreds of years. And this question that we were speaking about this afternoon of what does it mean to actually be in a place for that long? Mm -hmm. In many of these settlements, when you walk in, the first thing you will hear is, I have been here since 1975, since 1948. My children were born here. Or if you speak to some of the younger adults, and you know when they are told to go back to where they came from, to go back to the village, a 16-year-old child will turn around and say, what village? Like, they were born and bred as, as city residents. Um, and one of the things that struck us, struck me during the writing of this book is we were looking at where people go to the bathroom in resettlement colonies where often toilet facilities are not provided. And what struck me is that they had a pay and use toilet in this resettlement site. You had to pay two rupees per use. Um, and everyone seemed to pay it. And I could not understand why families whose income and expenditure um, balance sheets were so fragile would still pay several times a day for a family between five and eight to use. And what they turned around and said to me was, we are city people. We will not use the field. We are not villagers. And that identity of belonging to the city was strong enough for them actually to take precious money out of their pockets. So Eve, if you want to share the story you were telling me about Valiente this morning, about, um, yes. about the memory. We were trying to, to see what the definition is not covering. And one of the things which was is very sensitive, not only in these reports, but on all the work we, we can do with communities, you know, on evictions, is that what is being destroyed 